Good morning. My name is Hans Koch. I'm a conservation consultant based out of Indianapolis. I've been doing that for the last 10, 12 years. Before that, I worked for extension for about 15 years in Idaho, Washington, and Kansas. And I also did a stint in private industry, all working in no-till and soil and water conservation. I appreciate the invite by the Ohio No-Till Council to speak at your meeting and to open this conference for you. I wish I could have been there with you in person, but regretfully, due to the circumstances, we are all sitting in our own offices and watching each other on our computers. Today, I'd like to visit with you about soil health, cover crops, and the environment. Uh, we've heard a lot about soil health the last couple of years and of course cover crops and many of you may have tried cover crops at this point. Um, they do have an impact on the environment and that is a good thing generally speaking and I'd like to visit with uh, you about that a little bit. Uh, what we're going over today uh, will be the history of our soils. I want to take you back a little bit how you ended up with the soils you have on your farm. Uh, what did we do to those soils over the uh, last couple of uh, decades and maybe in some cases more than a century and that caused some issues we now have to deal with. Uh, we want to talk about some solutions and what this whole soil health thing is about. Uh, talk about the cover crops themselves and the impacts they have and hopefully at the end you'll have a better understanding of some of those issues. The Ice Ages did a major job, of course, on Ohio and the surrounding states. Uh, we had ice come down from Canada up to a mile thick and it basically bulldozed their entire landscape off. And in Ohio, of course, it was mainly the northern part of the state as it was in Indiana. And everything that we had before that time was bulldozed to the bottom. And so the hills in southern Ohio and southern Indiana are basically what our soils used to be in the northern part of the state. So we started with no soil when all that ice melted. And it's been warming ever since that ice melted and we're still going through that. So at first we had a very sparse popular uh, uh, vegetation. We had a, a, a prairie basically in most places with very shallow soils, mainly very heavy compacted, what we still have called glacial till. And slowly, slowly vegetation started to form on that. Of course, the climate wasn't very nice right after the glaciers melted and there was a lot of blowing soil going around. It was very dry. And then over a couple thousand years, we finally got to the vegetation that we had before we started farming here. And that was mainly forested areas for Ohio and Indiana and most of the eastern seaboard of the United States. If you go farther west and even in pockets in our states, uh, you would have found prairie. Uh, of course, that was still there when the settlers came, vast prairies out there and uh, with buffalo roaming on there. Uh, two very different landscapes with two very different soils that formed in there. When the settlers came, they took out all the trees. Can you imagine the work it took to do that? Taking out all the roots and started plowing the soils with the technology they had brought over from the East Coast and Europe. And for a while, things were very good. We had great harvest in these virgin soils. Of course, the prairie soils were deeper and better uh, than the forested soils, but we did, we did pretty well there. But it didn't take long and we started running into some issues and serious erosion picture from uh, late last century in uh, Wisconsin. And keep in mind, it took thousands of years to build these soils. And in a matter of decades, we had major issues and we lost a lot of those soils when we started farming them. Farther west on those prairie soils, uh, of course, everybody knows about the Dust Bowl in 1930s. A couple years of drought and all of a sudden everything started blowing like crazy. And again, that had a lot to do with the way we were farming those lands and those dust bowls were bad enough that it actually resulted in the formation of the Soil Conservation Service. 
Now, I hate to tell you, I worked in Kansas for eight years and I've seen those things. So it is still happening, not as much as it used to in the 30s, but uh, at least once a year or so, I've seen a cloud like that. And a couple of years ago, we had one going through uh, New Mexico and Texas. And here in Indianapolis, I had dirt on my car from those dust storms. So they're still happening. How can we actually get into that situation where we have erosion like that and we lose our soils that quickly? We had all this knowledge from a long history of farming in Europe. We brought technology that worked quite well out there for us and we had a lot of knowledge about farming and we still ran into trouble. And a lot of it had to do with that we came into a different climate and a different situation than we had in before. The other thing is that we didn't understand soils too well. We understand a lot about soil physics. Uh, every farmer knows whether they have a silt loam or a clay on their farms and what's underneath there quite often, whether that's a glacial till or gravel or some other sea horizon. We know quite a bit of the chemistry of soils. We take soil samples on a regular basis and that tells us how many nutrients we need to add to our soils. But the biology of the soils is something we don't know a lot about. In a lot of cases, we may know what the organic matter content is, but what that exactly means and what that is, we haven't really spent a lot of time on in the past. As a consequence, we haven't spent a lot of time on it, so we lost a lot of the soil biology. These are some data from uh, Illinois at the University of Illinois in Champaign. And they have had plots there since 1873. And you can see the red line is indicating what happened to the soil organic matter on those continuously farmed plots. And we have lost basically 80% of the soil organic matter in these soils, which has a huge impact on how those soils handle. Now, we weren't as lucky in Ohio and Indiana. We were under forest soils. We only started with about three or 4% organic matter and not 6% like they did on all those prairie soils in Illinois. Soil biology is on the one hand very complicated because you can't really see it. It's all minuscule, it's in the ground. The only thing we see is maybe some voles in the ground, some earthworms and uh, most of the other things we can't see. You need either a magnifying glass or you need uh, even a microscope to see some of the soil life in the soil. But there's a lot of soil life. And uh, if you take pictures of the soil, uh, the soil life shows up under a microscope. Looks very different from what we're used to above the ground. This is a bunch of fungi in the ground. At least that's what the scientist who gave me this picture told me. I don't know what I'm looking at when I look at these pictures. So it, it's very easy to forget about the soil biology. I grew up in the Netherlands and for me, I need something more simple. And this is more simple for me. These are 10 Holsteins. Looking on, walking on a lot of forage out there. I understand that. But what is underneath these Holsteins? What is, what is in the ground underneath them? Well, that's pretty simple too, because basically we have 10 Holsteins underneath the ground. And yes, I know that's weird. I grew up in Holland and we do stuff there that is different, uh, but it's the same for you. Why I'm using this is in a healthy soil, all the soil life in the first foot of the soil weighs as much as 15,000 pounds or the weight of roughly 10 cows per acre. So if you think about that, that you have about 10 cows worth of soil life underneath every acre of farmland that you have, those cows need to be fed, they need to be watered, they need to be taken care of. And since we didn't know that in the past, that we had that much soil life in those virgin soils we took out of the forest and the prairies, we have not taken care of that soil biology. And that's why we lost a lot of that soil biology with all the consequences we had. So now we're down to very low amounts of soil organic matter with all the consequences of that. We are not farming grandpa's soils anymore. He had much better soils than we did. His organic matter contents were higher, but the more intense we started farming them, the more tillage we started doing, we lost that organic matter, which means that right now we have lower water holding capacities, more runoff, more nutrient loss, and less aggregate stability which results in more erosion and more compaction. Now that last one is always surprising to me. I'm an agricultural engineer by training. And I think if you do a bunch of tillage, you would alleviate compaction and you do. However, if in the same process, you demolish your soil organic matter, that soil loses aggregate stability. The particles cannot hold together as well as they did before. And as a consequence, 
it compacts much easier the next time you drive over those soils. So big consequences for not having that organic matter. The next presentation you'll listen to is from Dr. Ratan Lal from Ohio State University. And he will actually make the link between organic matter and yields. And Dr. Lal, I apologize. I took this slide out of your presentation that follows mine. So uh, again, soil organic matter not only gives you all these negative effects, it also impacts your yield in a negative way. Can we reverse that organic matter loss? I mean, we didn't do this on purpose. We kind of mined our soils, not realizing we were mining them. Can we put that soil organic matter back in? And yes, we can. With no-till, uh, many farmers have shown you can slowly bring your organic matter back up. However, with no-till and cover crops and careful use of manures and other organic additions to your soil, you can have dramatic effects on the soil organic matter. And the light green line here is showing what one of the farmers I work with in Southern Illinois, Terry Taylor has done over his 40 years of farming land that he got with less than 2% organic matter on there. And he's brought it back to high 3% organic matter. Actually, some of his fields are now higher in organic matter than the surrounding forest soils that his great grandparents and grandparents started out with. And his soils look different. So he doesn't have the nice prairie soils that a lot of Illinois does. He has the same kind of soils Indiana and Ohio have, uh, these forest soils. His soils now look deep and dark with a lot of organic matter in there. By absolutely uh, taking out tillage by adding cover crops, crop rotations, and now and then adding manure to these fields, he's been able to do that. So we can reverse what has happened to our soils and improve them dramatically. So how do we get there? How do we get to a healthy soil? Well, NRCS has shown this picture to many of you for many years already. It says minimize disturbance. So back off on the amount of tillage you do, and hopefully you can do no tillage at all. Maximize the soil cover, keep residues on there and um, also cover crops. Maximize the diversity and then provide continuous living roots. Again, cover crops between every commercial crop we grow is going to be very important to improve those soils. Why are we hammering on this cover crop thing so much? Well, what we've been doing over the last decades or 100 years is basically growing corn and soybeans and, and some wheat. And we use the land basically five months out of the year. And the rest of it, it is barren. And when I went to school uh, a long time ago, I was told the soil needs to rest between those crops. And that turns out to be absolutely wrong. Soil never rests. Soil is always living. It's a living organism. You cannot just turn the knob off, wait for the soil till the next year, you come back and plant the crop again in there. All the soil biology, those 10 cows we talked about, need to be fed over winter, need to be taken care of. So we're basically having seven months of unused solar energy on our, all our fields. Uh, that we, we only use five months of it, seven months out of the 12, we're not using solar energy because nothing is growing. And Mother Nature sends us a very clear signal that she doesn't like that because she is trying to get weeds to grow out there. Well, that is a good signal that we're doing something wrong. Now, granted, seven months is not realistic. We have at least two months out there when everything is frozen and very cold and very little biology is happening but we have at least the opportunity to double the amount of time we can grow something in our fields. About 10 months a year, we should be able to grow things in our fields and that is usually those cover crops. The effect of cover crops, uh, the vast majority of case studies show that it is positive. We get erosion control, we get nutrient retention, we build organic matter back up, we get weed control. That's a newer use of cover crops, pretty spectacular. And drought and flood control. With all these uh, heavy rains we're getting and the droughty periods that are starting to show up every year, cover crops can really tie us through those periods. And I'll show you some slides of that. Increased yields. A lot of people say, well, you start using cover crops, it uses moisture, it uses nutrients, you cannot have higher yields. Yet all studies that we work in, if you manage your cover crops well, show us that you can definitely increase your yields. And more important, the economics on people using cover crops the right way 
is very positive. We've had some bad press for people trying cover crops and either getting lower yields or losing money. And that is mainly to do because cover crops were not managed right, not the right cover crops were picked. For instance, if you grow cereal rye in front of corn, you could get yourself in a lot of trouble because cereal rye uses a lot of water and it uses a lot of nitrogen. So you could have planting a crop, a corn crop in a very nitrogen deficient environment. So we need to be careful what we plant, where we plant it, when we plant it to make it successful. And we've learned by now how to do that. Here's a picture of 2012, the drought of 2012. Picture was taken in the middle of June. The drought had hit pretty hard already. On the left is a conventional tillage crop without any cover crops. And you see all the leaves of the corn plants are rolled up and it's in drought stress. On the right, there is no till after cereal rye cover crop. You can still see the residue of the cereal rye cover crop out there and you see the leaves are not rolled up. So the no-till with a cover crop, even though it was cereal rye in front of corn, worked quite well for this farmer. What did that mean? This is 65 bushels to the acre under, under the conventional tillage. That's about a half or a third of what those people normally get. But remember, 2012 was a drought year. Where the no-till and the cover crop had 40 bushel more in yield out there. That more than paid for the cover crop, of course. And, and with the prices we had in 2012, that paid for a lot more. So cover crops helped this farmer with the drought. Weed control, we've seen so many examples. This is a plot in Illinois, cereal rye planted, very heavy rate, 70 pounds an acre. And you see there are absolutely no weeds where we had the cereal rye in the spring. Radishes. A plot of radishes controlling weeds and you see outside the plot that's where there were no radishes we have a lot of weeds so radishes have some biofumigation effects and uh, you got to be a little careful don't plant radishes by themselves normally but they can be very helpful in weed control so resistant water hemp uh, i was very surprised last year to be at a meeting where a uh, chemical rep was actually telling us how well uh, cereal rye work. So this is soybeans planted in heavy cereal rye residue and you see the soybeans are doing quite well and the other thing you notice is there are no weeds. So the Bayer rep told us he had 98 percent weed control with cereal rye while all the chemical combinations they tried were not doing as well under weed control. So a good tool to have in the toolbox to control some of the nasty weeds like palmer amaranth and some of the water hems that are resistant to all the chemicals we're using Economics on cover crops, usually pretty good. Uh, let's talk a little bit about nutrients. So nutrients can be reduced if we use our cover crops well. We have a lot of nutrients left over at the end of the growing season, especially after corn crops or things like potato crops. And cover crops can really capture a lot of this material. And it also depends a little on the weather, uh, what we had. So again, this was 2012 and this is cereal rye that was planted after uh, corn. They had a pretty cruddy corn crop coming off of this field and they're going back to beans. And you see the cereal rye they planted has big streaks in it. And those streaks are exactly on the side dress bands in this field. So cereal rye is very good picking up nitrogen that is left in our fields. And this has actually been proven many decades ago. This is some work from the Chesapeake Bay area where they planted cereal rye and they planted it on different dates. The blue line is October 1, the red line is October 15 and the green line is planted on October 30th. And they followed how much red nitrogen was in the cereal rye all the way through March. So if you look at March 15th at the early planted cereal rye, there is almost 160 pounds of nitrogen taken up by that cereal rye. March 15, that cereal rye was probably 12 inches, 16 inches tall. That is not a huge tall crop, but it has a lot of nitrogen taken up. Had we waited till October, or till October 30th to plant it, we would have had less than half the nitrogen in there. So planting that cereal rye early is very important if you want to capture all that nitrogen. While they looked at the cereal rye, they also looked at the soil. And here's some pictures of the soil. So the soil profile is shown here, the depth of the soil down to five foot deep. They measured the nitrogen in the soil. And it shows the dark blue line, the, the 
pink line is no cover. You see we have very high nitrogen content in the top of the soil and then as we go down there's less nitrogen left because that's where the, the corn roots have taken it out. The dark line shows you where there is a rye cover crop. This is taken November 1st. The cover was planted October 1st. So it's been in the field only uh, 30 days, one month, and it's taken from 191 where there's no cover to 157. So about 30 pounds of nitrogen were already taken up in the first month. A month later, you can see that uh, this nitrogen is starting to go down the, the profile. The pink line again is where there's no cover. You see that bulge of nitrogen is moving down with the rain. But look how much nitrogen the cereal rye has already taken up in the top of the soil. In the bottom, it's all still pretty much the same. Now we've taken up almost 70 pounds of nitrogen out of the soil profile. And then if you look at it again in March, you see that bulge of nitrogen is moving down the profile, basically going into the groundwater. It's about two feet deep right now. Where there is a cereal rye cover crop, there's no nitrogen left. It's all in the cereal rye cover crop. 140 pounds, like I showed you in the last slide, 160 pounds is in that cereal rye cover crop and that is one of the reasons why we want to be careful planting cereal rye in front of a corn crop because there is no nitrogen in the ground while normally you would have some nitrogen left at one foot and deeper in the soil profile. What was the consequence for the environment? Well, when they started using those uh, cover crops in the late 80s, you see slowly the nitrogen in the soil in the groundwater in that area came down. And in, uh, in about 15 years, they had the groundwater levels down to where you need to be for drinking water. So they're really reducing the amount of nitrogen ending up in the groundwater out there. The green line is no-till. No-till responded extremely fast, but even tilled fields responded in having less nitrogen in the groundwater. We've done quite a bit of measuring of uh, these cover crops. This is one of our farmers in Indiana that measured a cereal rye in the field. It was 12 inches high. He had 82 pounds of nitrogen in there with a biomass of 2000 pounds to the acre. Not an awful lot of cover crop there, only 12 inches tall. 82 pounds measured by the lab after we sent in those samples. At 18 inches, a couple of weeks later, 120 pounds of nitrogen in there. And just before he killed it, it was 28 inches tall, 134 pounds of nitrogen per acre in that cereal rye. Now the farmer was very interested to find out what happens later in the year. When do I get that nitrogen back that the cereal rye took out of my field? So in August, he came in, took a sample of the dead cereal rye that was laying between his uh, bean plants and he measured 84 pounds of nitrogen there. So 50 pounds had already been released by that dead cereal rye back into the crop. That is like a late side dress or late nitrogen application in your fields. And one of the reasons that I work with so many farmers that are low on their fertilizer application is a lot of these cover crops. They let the cover crops basically scavenged nitrogen and other nutrients out of the ground and uh, so they can reduce their nitrogen or their fertilizer they apply. And I work with a whole group of farmers that are probably applying half of the university recommended nitrogen. Now you cannot do that right away. That takes 10 years or so of no tilling and cover crops before you get to that situation. And you got to be very careful. You got to sample a lot and figure out uh, whether you can actually cut back on your nitrogen. And my recommendation is always do it in a strip. Don't do the whole field, just do a strip, take the nitrogen down or the nutrients down to where you think you're still safe and see whether it actually works for you. Another farmer in uh, North Central Indiana, he uh, grows 165 bushel corn with about 170 pounds to the acre nitrogen. Uh, 12 years continuous no-till, six years in cover crops. He sampled his soil on December 12th, the first two feet. Where there was no cover crop, he had 116 pounds of nitrogen left. So quite a bit of nitrogen of the 170 he had applied is still in his fields. Where annual ryegrass was flown on, he only had 12 pounds left. So the annual ryegrass had slurped up all that leftover nitrogen in his field and saves it for the next crop to make it available. Radishes can take up a lot of nitrogen uh, close to... Uh, Actually, this was done by Ohio State with uh, one of our uh, uh, Kansas uh, seed dealers. 
the tops of nitrogens had uh, the radishes had 130 pounds of uh, nitrogen per acre the tubers had 95 for a total of 225 pounds to the acre so uh, that was after manure application so there was plenty of nitrogen available for those radishes to take up when they planted them with oats uh, after manure, they had 168 pounds in there. So you see, if you plant, if you apply manure to a field, these cover crops can be extremely helpful in sequestering that manure and holding on to it for you for the next season. Uh, try not to plant radishes by themselves. We've seen that these uh, they suppress all the other cover crops in the field or other other growth in the field. And a field of radishes uh, can take all the nitrogen out and and when they die, you could have some erosion problems in the spring. So always plant them with something else like oats or cereal rye or a whole number of different cover crops. Another example in 19, uh, we flew a mix into standing beans of oats, barley, crimson and rapeseed. And on September 9th and on November 15th, we came back and measured uh, almost uh, 800 pounds to the acre biomass. So not a lot of growth out there, but it still had 30 pounds of nitrogen taken up with that light of a cover of, uh, of uh, cover crops. So they will take up nutrients for you and save them for you for the next uh, crop. So uh, can we the fertilizer savings with cover crops? Can we actually grow nitrogen? Because the literature is always full of uh, 200 pounds of nitrogen grown by cover crops. Uh, that is really pushing it, especially in northern Indiana and uh, northern um, Ohio. So we need to be a little careful uh, figuring out how much nitrogen we can grow and how you do that. And yes, it can be done. This is one of the farmers I work with in central Illinois. And this was picture was taken on May 9th and he's planting his corn into his hairy vetch. Now that takes a lot of adjustments of equipment and getting used to. So we can grow enough nitrogen to actually grow corn crops, but you have to really be careful with that and be willing to plant that corn crop quite a bit later and pick cover crops you can handle and you can get your planter through. Uh, actually, this farmer is working on some different systems. Uh, yes, they can go straight to the hairy veg, but they would like to see a little different system where they are actually skipping the corn rows and do not plant the cover crop on there, or they put, for instance, oats on the corn rows and um, to get the planter through easier. You probably all have heard about Dave Brandt, where he uh, plants radishes right on the corn row and then some other cover crops in the non corn rows. So those systems work pretty well and you can grow quite a bit of uh, nitrogen for your crops. Here's the planter going through in one of those systems where they have skipped rows uh, to get the planter through easier. Big, big mixes. This is called pollinator palooza. It's uh, used by Rick Clark, one of the farmers I work with here in Indiana. It has an enormous amount of different crops in there. And this is actually what he uses on his organic corn as the total nitrogen for his crop. So this is mix is costing him less than $30 an acre. He grows the nitrogen for 150 bushel corn crop on there. Again, you cannot just do that. This is after years of crop rotation in no-till, years of cover crops, and then also he now and then runs cattle through there. So it can be done. We can really reduce the amount of uh, fertilizer we need for our crops and grow ourselves, but uh, it takes a lot of management. You need to have cover crops that will freeze out and the cover crops that do not freeze out, you need to be able to handle those and terminate them. And in his case, since he's going organic in this field, he cannot use any chemicals to kill the cover crop. So he needs to pick stuff he can roll or he can graze out and uh, get rid of the cover crops in the standing crop. How much nitrogen can we grow? Well, um, another example of Rick, he frost seeded some uh, mix uh, on March 11th. Uh, it was oats, balanza fixation clover, radishes and rapeseed, chicory and hairy vetch. And on June 10th, so three months later, he did a nutrient analysis on that. So he planted his crop a little later. He had 110 pounds of nitrogen in there, 50 pounds of uh, P205, 147 of O460, 177 pounds of K2O and 16 pounds of magnesium and also uh, 23 pounds of sulfur. 
another nutrient we often need to add to corn and soybeans now because we're running a little short on that in a lot of soils. So a lot of nitrogen grown there, again, with a pretty complicated mix, and you need to be able to get rid of that before you plant your next crop in there. Covers work the best when you uh, reduce the tillage. We need to reduce tillage anyhow, because uh, our soils need to heal from all the tillage we've done. And adding cover crops uh, to that situation help a lot. So if you if you do a transition from, for instance, full tillage to strip tillage, which works pretty well in corn, and then go no-till in the beans, which most people have figured out how to make work, cover crops will do well in those environments. Now, covers need to be planted early. Uh, you see that all these farmers, all the pictures I showed you so far show a lot of uh, benefits of covers as long as they are large. Large cover crops do better for you. So you need to plant them early. So here's a picture of September 15 versus October 15 planting on the bottom of the picture. And this is annual ryegrass on picture taken on November 4th. And you see there's a large difference if you go a month earlier in planting that. So for a lot of our cover crops in Northern Indiana and uh, Northern Ohio, September 15 is really the cutoff for most cover crops. Uh, cereal rye is the only thing we can plant a lot later. So that means a lot of these cover crops need to go in standing crops. A lot of farmers have gone uh, even earlier. Uh, the Canadians have figured out you can put cover crops in uh, between V4 and V6 in corn. We call that interseeding and uh, they've been pretty successful with it. It really works best north of I-70. So this is not a good plan for the southern part of the state. Uh, Lauren Steinlage here in Iowa planting some uh, cover crops at V3. Uh, flying cover crops in either early in the season or a little later in the season, but before we can get in with the drill is a good option. And then of course, high boys putting cover crops in has really helped getting cover crops in very early. Uh, get them in early and kill them late. Uh, keep them growing as long as you can so you get maximum benefit out of those covers. I showed you the picture already of uh, Junior Upton in, Ohio, in uh, Illinois and uh, how he let his cover crops grow well into May and planted in there. Um, it's not a new idea. We have farmers in Indiana here planting uh, corn into peas in 2012. Again, some nitrogen out of that and in the cover crop 2013 planting beans and cereal rye we've been doing this for quite a while 14 corn into cereal rye again you got to be careful you have to have nitrogen on there to make sure that that corn uh, is not short of nitrogen and uh, so either people go in with a quick early side dress or they have enough nitrogen on the planter when you do that and here, June 1, planting beans after heavy rains. They had two inches of rain the de two days before. And I asked the farmer, I said, how can you plant in that stuff? Well, since he has so much cereal rye, he was able to get through there. And we actually dug some holes in that field, very little to no compaction. Uh, of course, a track tractor and then no tilling beans into this cereal rye and then afterward rolling it to kill it. Uh, mixes. Do you use simple cover crops, very complicated cover crops? Um, this is just oats and uh, radishes and uh, this looks much better than it does in most fields. This is November 15 because this was done after wheat with a manure application. So it had a lot more growth than in your regular fields. Uh, normally you look more at this kind of stuff. Actually this farmer was so unhappy about a cereal rye crop, he called it. And he said, hey, we put cereal rye in. I spent all this money on there and this is all I got. And it's freezing already, not much happening out there. So we dug a hole with a shovel and actually we had to go back to the shed and get the backhoe and dig a big hole because we kept finding roots. And in this particular field, roots were very deep into the soil, the cereal rye roots. And you see this is glacial till over a very shallow uh, topsoil, under a very shallow topsoil. Uh, you see some earthworm holes already going down in the profile and the cereal rye roots following those earthworm holes. So in a no-till situation, you will start opening up that, uh, that uh, glacial till underneath your soils. Cover crops will go in there. Corn and beans, not so much. It's just too tough for them, but some cover crops can go in there. So that is the difference between cover crops and our commercial crops. We really look at the roots. We want uh, cover crops with strong roots that can go into situations where our corn and beans do not like to go. How big do the cover crops need to be? Now, this is of course a very weird situation again. This is a 15 way mix planted after wheat 
after manure application. And the tall crop, of course, is your sorghum sedan grass, but uh, you, see the, you see the hemp's in here, there's radishes in there, there's all sorts of stuff growing in there. This farmer is going after wheat, going back to corn. How can you plant corn into this stuff? So we actually mounted a camera on a post and uh, looked what the cover crop did. Um, yes, those mixes will take enormous amounts of phosphorus out of your ground. So that's a good place to use those if you have high phosphorus situations. So after the first frost and the snow in January 3rd, this cover crop is way down already. And then March 27th, there is not much left because we've selected these cover crops to all freeze out. And the farmer actually went in and strip tilled corn right into this field. Or you can take that big mix and actually stick cattle on there. These are two farmers in Western Indiana. They uh, grazed a similar mix that we just looked at the six foot tall mix and uh, they grazed it off with cattle and then they planted their corn in there. And that's another way, to, of course, to get rid of those uh, big cover crops. Again, you need wheat back in rotation. You need to have somebody who can run their cattle in your field to do this for you. And you need to manage it because you could get a lot of compaction if you let the cattle be in there very long. So they do flash grazing with this, cattle in, cattle out. Improving the soils with all this. Um, so cover crops are very good for situations like pipelines. Um, if uh, we've had quite a few pipelines coming through Northern uh, Ohio, and I've been in some field days last year where um, we, we looked at that. Um, we had one field uh, where the, the, the yield of beans versus the pipeline are pretty dramatic. Uh, so here's a bean plant outside the pipeline area and here's the plant that was in the pipeline area. Now the pipeline itself is not the issue. It is more the area next to it where they do all the traffic and they go in there when it's wet and they compact the heck out of it. So heavy use of cover crops in those areas for one or two years to just open up the soil so you can get your crops back because it's going to take forever to get the crops to do that themselves. Uh, reclaimed mine lands, we've used cover crops extensively there to get those soils back in halfway decent uh, shape. Um, uh, one of the farmers wasn't able to get a crop in on his repaired on his uh, mine land and uh, so he used that to um, get the soil repaired work on drainage uh, put some cattle facilities in there and then planted a cover he planted winter wheat in there uh, in the crop area and then uh, when he got enough growth in there he would, could consider grazing it in the fall or in the spring, depending on how much growth he had on the wheat. Then uh, this year he put in, uh, after wheat harvest, he planted a grazing mixture with some fertilization, grazed that, and then after the grazing in September, he seeded clover, vetch, oats, radish cover mix. Then next year he plans to uh, plant corn into that field, uh, fly cereal rye into the standing corn before harvest, and if there's enough growth, he might graze that cereal rye but maybe just uh, in the spring of 2022, he'll do that. So he will terminate that cereal rye and he has some options. He can either use herbicide when it's 12 to 16 inches high. He can uh, use a roller crimper when it's very large and uh, just before or after planting of soybeans, or he can bale and remove the rye cover crop or graze it, of course, in, in that case. And then he goes back to soybeans followed by winter wheat and that rotation is complete and keeps doing that till the soils are really improving. So we've uh, talked a lot about cover crops, what they can do, how they can improve your soil and your yields and, and all those issues. Uh, some, some economics here for you. So one of the farmers here did a comparison between 2011 and 2019, and he ranked the percentage of what he's using. His diesel uh, is 43% down. This is a large farmer that saves him 35,000 a year. His horsepower is down a lot in his equipment. He replaces it with much smaller equipment because he's no tilling and using rollers and not doing any tillage. Fertilization is down 50%. They no longer use MAP or DAP. They no longer use potash. They no longer use lime. And their chemicals are down 80% because they get very good weed control with their cover crops. So on his farm, he's saving $670,000 a year in cost just by changing systems to no-till and cover crops. That is about $100 per acre every year. We're talking about $5 corn, $3 corn. This guy is saving $100 a year 
by just going to cover crops and no-till. And that doesn't include the fact that he's going to organic and gets higher uh, premiums on his crops. So just in the savings that everybody else can do without going to organic. Environmental impacts. We've had a lot of studies done in especially Lake Erie Basin to see what cover crops are doing. And uh, Kevin King's uh, group with ARS has done quite a few edge of field studies where they looked at tail, uh, uh, tile drainage water. Uh, Jennifer Tank from Notre Dame has done a lot of work in northern Indiana where they really looked at uh, water running into the creeks and, and what was in that water, especially nitrogen. Uh, of course, they know that uh, cover crops reduce erosion dramatically, and that has an impact on phosphorus, of course. Uh, reduced runoff by building more organic matter and uh, fewer nutrients leaving the farm. And then the tile drain discharge, uh, reduced nitrogen in tile water and some reduction in phosphorus. Now the phosphorus is slower. That uh, really depends on the buildup of uh, organic matter uh, in the soils and getting uh, reduced um, runoff out of your tiles as well as you do over land. So we lost a lot of organic matter. We can build that organic matter back up and it depends on whether we just do no-till or we do like Terry, we do no-till plus cover crops plus uh, manure applications to change that around. Right now, it's kind of interesting. So to get organic matter back in the soil, you need a lot of carbon. Well, we have a lot of carbon in the atmosphere right now, higher than we used to. And there are multiple opportunities to get paid to put that carbon back in there. We have Indigo Ag with their Terraton initiative is paying farmers to take the nitrogen out of the, or the carbon out of the atmosphere. Bayer is paying farmers 20 bucks, I think roughly an acre for using no-till and cover crops. Ecosystem Services Marketing Consortium is a group that is setting up carbon markets where farmers can actually sell uh, what they've done, the carbon credits they've taken. And um, this is a large group that is uh, really run by companies like McDonald's and ADM and uh, Nestle and other food companies uh, to, um, to get to doing something about climate change, which they feel their customers really want to happen. And so they're willing to pay for that. So they're setting up a big market. Cargill is going to pay farmers in Iowa for carbon sequestration, basically with no-till and cover crops. Shopify, a large um, company that is doing online markets, uh, is paying farmers in Iowa. And one farmer is getting $200,000 for his farm, what he's done already in nutrient management. And Nori is the outfit that does this uh, market setup for them. Nutrient just announced they're gonna pay farmers for carbon uh, sequestration in their fields. And NRCS is talking heavily about the CSP program being shifted to paying for carbon sequestration. So multiple opportunities coming are already here to help farmers actually take the carbon out of the atmosphere and help it build back that organic matter in their fields. So plenty of opportunities out there. In summary, to improve our soil, we need to reduce disturbance. We have to back off on the amount of tillage we do, otherwise we'll never be able to improve our soils. Keeps the soils covered, residue and cover crops, and always have something growing. In those months when there are no corn or beans or wheat in there, something else needs to be growing. The tops of those cover crops provide protection from the rain. The roots feed the soil, nutrients are taken up, both improve the soil, both in biology and organic matter building. And consider your rotation. Can wheat come back in your rotation? And we have plenty of spreadsheets to show you what the financial consequences are for that. But wheat gives you opportunities uh, for either double crop soybeans if you're south a little bit, or for cover crops that can do more in your soils uh, and, and help you build these soils back up. People often think that soil uh, changes and soil health is a very slow process. And yes, it's not lightning fast, like you put some extra nitrogen in there, you see an effect right away. But here's a picture for one year of working on a soil. On the left is the soil where we didn't put a cover crop on there and it's kind of chunky and, and there are big clods and it's not structured very well. On the right is where we put a mix of cover crops for the very first time ever on this field and look what the soil difference is. Those roots going in there, breaking it up, 
making a difference all structure already. It is dramatic. Actually, I had to drive out to go see this for myself because when the guy sent me this picture, I didn't believe him. I thought they doctored something or so, but I saw it with my own eyes. It changes rapidly. Now, does that first year change your yields right away? Does it change your soil organic matter? No, it does not. But it shows you that these cover crops are having a dramatic impact and we can have use them to help us build our soils, keep our environment safe and um, be beneficial and economically uh, sustainable on our farms. I really appreciate the time I got spent with you and I hope you enjoyed this presentation too. My email is at the bottom here. I know we don't have question and answer today. So hopefully that will help you to actually, um, if you need to ask me some questions, I'd be happy to help you with that. And with that, uh, I look forward to listening uh, to Dr. Ratanlal, who's our next speaker. Thank you very much.